Um, okay. Uh, I think we're starting. Yeah. Uh, well, hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Ricardo from Igalia. Uh, most of my work revolves around CTS tests and the Vulkan specification. And today I'll be talking about uh, ne the new mesh shader extension for Vulkan that was published like a month ago. So I participated in the release process for this extension uh, by writing thousands of uh, tests uh, and reviewing and discussing the specification text for Vulkan, YLSL, and Spruppy. Uh, so mesh shaders are a new way of uh, processing geometry in the graphics pipeline. So essentially, uh, they introduce an alternative way of creating graphics uh, pipelines in Vulkan. Uh, but they don't introduce a completely new type of pipeline. Uh, the new extension is multi-vendor and uh, heavily based on the NVIDIA-only uh, extension that existed before. Uh, but some details have been fine-tuned to make it closer to the uh, DirectX 12 version of mesh shaders and to make it easier to implement for, for other vendors. Um, so I want to cover basically what you see here, what mesh shaders are, uh, how they compare to the classic pipelines, and how they solve some, some problems. Then uh, we will take a look at what a mesh shader looks like and how it works, and we'll also talk about drawbacks that mesh shaders have. Uh, so mesh shading uh, basically introduces a new type of graphics pipeline uh, with a much smaller number of stages compared to the classic one. Uh, one of the new stages is called the mesh shading stage. Uh, and these new pipelines try to address some issues and shortcomings with the, with the classic pipelines uh, on modern GPUs. The new pipeline stages have many things in common with compute shaders, as we will see. Um, <clears throat> so this is a simplified version of the classic pipeline. You probably know it very well. And basically, a pipeline can be divided in two parts. The first stages are in charge of uh, generating geometry uh, for the rasterizer. And then the rasterizer uh, does a lot of magic, including primitive clipping, uh, barycentric interpolation, and preparing fragment data for, for fragment shader invocations, obviously. So it's technically possible to replace the whole pipeline with a compute shader. And I think there's a talk on Thursday about that. Uh, <laughs> But mesh shaders do not touch the rasterizer and everything that, that comes after it. Uh, mesh shaders try to apply a compute model to uh, replace some of this with a shader that's similar to compute, but the changes are restricted to the first part of, of the pipeline. So if I have to cut the presentation short for some reason, this is probably one of the slides you should focus on, like mesh shading uh, employs a shader that's similar to compute to generate some geometry for the rasterizer. And there's no input assembly, no, no vertex shader, no tessellation, etc. So everything that you did with those stages is now done in, a, uh, in the new mesh shading stage, which is a bit more flexible and more powerful. Um, and in reality, the mesh shading extension actually introduces two new stages. There's an optional text shader that runs before the mesh shader, but we are going to forget about it for now. <laughs> To simplify things. Uh, so these are the problems that mesh shading tries to solve. Uh, vertex inputs are a bit annoying to implement in drivers and in, in some hardware they use uh, specific fixed function units that may be a bottleneck in, in some cases, at least in at least in theory. Uh, the main pain point is that vertex shaders are working at the, at the per vertex level, obviously. So uh, you don't generally have control of how geometry uh, uh, is arranged in primitives. So you may run several vertex shader invocations that end up forming a primitive that faces back and it's not visible, and there's no uh, easy way to filter those out. Uh, so you waste computing power, memory bandwidth, reading data for those vertices, etc. Some implementations do some clever stuff here, uh, trying to avoid these issues. Uh, and finally, tessellation and geometry shaders should perhaps be simpler and more powerful, and it should work like compute shaders, like two, so we process vertices in parallel and more efficiently and everything. So, uh, so far, uh, I've told you that mesh shaders look, look a bit like compute shaders, and they need to generate geometry for the rasterizer. Uh, because they're, uh, so let's, let's take a look. Uh, I'm going to give you an example in YLSL to make it uh, easier to read as, and so you can see it needs a new extension, which uh, when translated to Spear V will be converted into a Spear V extension that gives you access to some new opcodes and new functionality, obviously. 
Uh, the first similarity to compute shaders is that mesh shaders are dispatched in uh, three groups, work groups like, like compute shaders. And each of them has a number of local invocations in 3D controlled by the shader itself. Uh, same deal. There, there's a limit to the size of uh, each work group, uh, but the minimum mandatory limit by the, by the, speci by the specification sorry, is 128 invocations. And if the hardware does not support uh, work groups that size, they are going to be, they are going to be emulated. Um, <clears throat> we also have a properties structure in, in Vulkan where you can check with this, which is the recommended maximum size for work groups according to, to the driver. Uh, and inside the body of your shader, you get access to the typical built-ins for compute shaders, like the number of work groups, work group ID, local invocation indices, etc. Obviously, and if subgroups are supported, you may also get uh, you can also use a group operations and built-ins and everything in that. Uh, but mesh shaders also have to generate geometry somehow. So the type uh, cannot be chosen at a certain time. So when writing a shader, you have to decide if your shader will, will output triangles, lines, or points. And you have to say that in the shader. That's the first thing different from compute shaders. Uh, then you must also indicate like an upper limit in the number of vertices and primitives that you are going to generate with each work group. Uh, generally speaking, this is going to be a smallish number. So in fact, in, in practice, several implementations will limit you to 256 vertices and primitives uh, at most, which is the minimum required limit uh, according to the specification. And to handle big meshes with this, you will need several work groups, and each work group will handle a, a piece of the whole mesh, obviously. Uh, in each work group, the local invocations are supposed to cooperate to generate arrays of uh, vertex and primitive data. So <coughs> uh, here you can see how, after perhaps some initial processing you, you cannot see here, you have to indicate how many actual vertices and primitives the work group will emit using this uh, set mesh outputs ext call. Uh, and that call goes first before filling any output arrays, and you can reason about it as letting the implementation allocate the appropriate amount of memory for those output arrays for, or something like that. Mesh shaders output uh, index geometry, like when you use vertex and index buffers together. So uh, you need to write data for each vertex to an output array and uh, primitive indices to another output array. Uh, typically, uh, each invocation uh, handles one position or a chunk of those arrays. Uh, and so they cooperate together to fill the whole thing. And in the slide here, you see a couple of those arrays, which is, are the most typical ones. So you have the built-in mesh, uh, mesh vertices EXT array, which contains per vertex data, um, <coughs> like uh, the vertex position. And this is used with this array going from zero to the actual number of vertices minus one, obviously. And then the primitive triangle indices EXT array contains uh, for each triangle three UINT indices into the previous vertices array. That's how it works. Um, uh, the, pre the primitive indices array uh, itself is accessed using indices from zero to actual uh, to the actual number of primitives minus one, obviously. And so, if there's a second uh, slide that I want you to remember. Uh, it's probably this one. What you, we have here is like an initial template to write any uh, mesh shader. Uh, for example, I, I used like a template like this one when I was writing CTS tests for the extension. Uh, there are a few more details we can add, obviously, to the shader. Uh, for example, mesh shaders can also generate custom output attributes that will be interpolated and, and used as input to the, to the fragment shader, uh, just like vertex shaders can. Uh, the difference is that in mesh shaders, they form arrays. Uh, um, so if we uh, say nothing, like in the first output here, uh, they are considered per vertex, and they have the same index range as the mesh vertices array. And a nice addition for mesh shaders is that, is that you can use the per primitive EXT uh, keyword to indicate that output attributes are per primitive, right? Uh, and do not need to be interpolated like the second output you can see there. Uh, if you use this, you need to declare them with the same keyword in the fragment shader, so the interfaces uh, match between mesh and fragment. Um, 
Indices to these arrays uh, have the same range as the built-in uh, primitive indices array, obviously. And of course, if there is no input assembly, uh, we need to read data from, from somewhere. So uh, typically, you use descriptors like storage buffers, containing vertex, maybe index information, whatever, or you can also generate geometry using compute. That also works, anything works. Um, so just to show you a few more details, these are uh, the built-in arrays used for geometry. There are arrays of indices for, for triangles, lines, or points, uh, depending on what the shader is supposed to generate. Uh, and the mesh vertex CXT array that we saw before can contain a bit more data apart from the position. You have the point size, the clip distances, and call distances, for example. And then there's a third array that I didn't use before. I'm showing it here for the first time. Uh, you can see it's per primitive. Uh, it's declared with a keyword. And uh, you can indicate a few things like the primitive ID, uh, the layer, the viewport index, whatever. You can modify and output per primitive data from there. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, each word group can only emit a relatively small number of uh, primitives and vertices. So for big models, uh, you need to dispatch several word groups, and each of them is in charge of generating and processing what is usually called a meshlet, which are the colored patches that you see here on the bunny. Uh, and it's worth men mentioning that the subdivision of uh, big meshes into meshlets is typically done when preparing assets for the application. So I mean, there shouldn't be any runtime delay when preparing the meshlets. They are pre-chosen, basically. Uh, and then uh, mesh shading word groups are dispatched with uh, specific commands inside a render pass. And they work very similar to compute dispatches. As you can see here, you specify a 3D size and then launch a number of word groups for those. Uh, so let's talk a bit about uh, task shaders, uh, which are optional in theory, but then Tim will tell you a bit more about them. Uh, if if they are present, they, they go before mesh shaders. And the dispatch comments that we just saw uh, do not control the number of mesh shader work groups. They control the number of task shader work groups that are dispatched. And then each task shader work group will dispatch a number of mesh shader work groups. And it can decide that at runtime. So it looks like this. Uh, each Task shader work groups also follows the, the compute model uh, with a number of local invocations uh, that cooperate together. And each work group typically processes geometry in, in some way and amplifies or reduces the amount of work that needs to be done. So that's why it's called uh, the amplification shader, shader in DirectX 12. And once that pre-processing is done, each task work group decides at runtime how many mesh work groups to launch as childs. They form a, a tree with two levels. Um, one interesting detail about this is that compute built-ins in uh, mesh shaders may not be unique when, when using task shaders. They are only unique per branch. So in this example, we dispatch a couple of task shader work groups, and each of them decided to dispatch two and uh, three mesh shader work groups, res respectively. So some mesh shaders work groups uh, will have the same work group ID. And even if, if the second task shader work group had launched uh, two children instead of three, even the number of work groups would be the same for all those. So. Uh, we probably want them to process different things. Uh, so the way to tell them apart from inside the mesh shader is, uh, is to use a payload, which is a piece of data that is generated in each task work group and uh, is uh, passed down to its children as uh, read-only data. Uh, combining the payload with existing built-ins allows you to process different things in each mesh shader work group. That's basically how it's done. Uh, this is done like this, I just put you in a sample there. So on the left, you have a task shader, is the first uh, one I show you. Uh, you can see it, it also works like a compute shader and invocations cooperate to pre-process the staff and to generate the payload. Uh, and the payload is a variable declared with a task payload shared EXT qualifier. So these payloads work like shared memory from the task shader. And that's why they have the shared in the qualifier, obviously. And in the mesh shader, 
they are read only. You can declare them the same payload as in the task shader and you can read data from it. Uh, so advantages of mesh shaders. Um, you first of all you you can avoid input assembly bottlenecks if they exist. And you can pre-compute data and discard geometry in advance, uh, saving processing power and memory band bandwidth. Uh, geometry and tessellation uh, can be applied freely, uh, more flexible ways. You can do whatever you want because you're in a computer-like shader. And uh, in more flexible ways. Uh, and the use of a model similar to compute allows shaders to take advantage, advantage of uh, GPU processing power more effectively, in theory. Uh, Many games, for example, also use a compute prepass to process some data and calculate things that will uh, be needed at draw time. Uh, and with mesh shaders, it may be possible to streamline this and integrate this processing into the mesh or more commonly the task shader. Uh, and you can also abuse mesh shader, mesh shading pipelines as compute pipelines with two levels if you need to do so. Uh, these advantages of uh, mesh shading, uh, for example, mesh shading is problematic for tiling GPUs, as you can imagine, for uh, reasons similar to tessellation geometry shaders, uh, because uh, those reasons. And giving users freedom in this part of the pipeline may allow them to, to shoot themselves in the foot and end up with suboptimal performance. Uh, Timur will, will tell you some performance tips uh, about that. Uh, if not used properly, mesh shaders may be slower than classic pipelines. Uh, so the structure of uh, vertex and index buffers sometimes also needs to be declared explicitly in shaders to read, read from them, uh, like storage buffers. So that increases the coupling between CPU and GPU code, which is not nice. But probably the most important drawback of mesh shading right now is that it's hard or sometimes even impossible, like we could say, uh, to write a single mesh shader that performs great on all implementations. That's the main disadvantage. So some vendor uh, preferences are exposed as properties by the extension, uh, and you can read those. And you, you can see that NVIDIA loves uh, smaller work groups, if possible, and using loops to encode to generate geometry with, with each invocation. So several vertices and triangles per invocation. That's what NVIDIA likes a lot. And then threads on AMD, they typically can only generate at most one vertex and one primitive. Uh, so they love you to use uh, bigger work groups and use the local invocation index to access per vertex and per primitive arrays. So they can apply a lot of optimizations and everything. Uh, so as you can imagine, this probably results in different mesh shaders for each vendor, uh, even if both are mesh shaders. And that's it. Uh, questions? <laughs> Careful. I'm curious just about um, if you look at Metal 3, is there a shared implementation and how that would they support how that compares to the Sorry, can, can you repeat? And the Apple uh, Metal 3 support, using Metal 3 that have mesh shader support, which they introduced. I'm so just curious how that compares in terms of to the function inspector view. So the question is how, uh, I had to repeat the question for people. Uh, yeah. So the question is how do mesh shaders in uh, Apple Metal uh, differ from this? And it's a bummer because I have no idea. I have never worked on on Metal, uh, so there's. <laughs> um, I wonder if you could is it viable to implement the classical pipeline on top of a mesh shader pipeline, or would hardware need separate pipelines there? Uh, I don't know. It's a, I, I think in theory it's possible because you can emulate basically. Uh, Timur wants to say something. Uh, oh yeah, I re have to repeat the question. If, the, if, the, um, if it's possible to emulate the classic pipeline using mesh shaders, and in theory it is using some tricks because uh, you have the vertex input assembly so you can generate mesh shader code uh, for reading that and then everything works the same but you have to 
use com uh, mesh shaders to, to emulate uh, tessellation and, and geometry shaders. It's going to be a bit more complex, but yeah, in theory, I think it can be done because it uses the same hardware in practice. Um, I just want to ask, would it, be, would it make sense to characterize cap shaders as something that basically is yeah. And so the question is, if uh, task shaders are used to decide the uh, are used to decide how to dispatch the shaders, yeah. So, so that's basically what they are used. They are called the amplification shaders. Oh, and they you can decide, for example, Timur will tell you more about that. But you can use it to for for uh, choosing load levels or load detail. Or you can uh, cut in, th cuts in short, like this is not visible. This whole thing is not visible, so I'm not going to launch anything to try to generate geometry for this part of, of the scene or something like that. Yeah, they can be, task shaders usually uh, try to pre-process geometry and, and do some selection and, and uh, launch the appropriate number of mesh shader workgroups so it works optimally and doesn't, you doesn't waste hardware resources. This is very important. In practice, it's very important to use task shaders to decide how many mesh workgroups you really need and, and to do some, some work there. 